So we're in the middle of the story of the Gideon test. The first one was learning to how, how to pick out God's voice in a noisy generation. The next one is a test of placing God's direction above every other concern. Once you can hear God's voice and know what it is in your life, you still have to get to the place where you're able to cause that to be the more important thing in your life. And so I want you to take a look at um, chapter 6, verses 25 to 32. And in verse 25, I want you to know that in order to place God's direction above all the other concerns, we, um, we have to learn to be bold for God. You have to be willing to pay a price for following him. And that price may include precious things, important things, or even, wait for it, sacred cows. Let me see if I can figure out exactly where that comes from in verse 25. Now on the same night, the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and a, uh, and a second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. So he says, I want you to take these bulls and I want you to knock down this totem pole-like worship fixture that is a protection to your family, they believe. It's a false god, but it's a protection to your family in their uh, view, and knock it down. It is a place for cultic worship and it is a place for pagan worship. So in essence, he has to go and I want you to take your father's new John Deere tractor and drive it off the end of a cliff. I want you to take your father's new Chevy and go smash it into a, into a pulp into the forest. What he's asking him to do is something that's very tough to do. But before God is willing to work, the other gods have to get out of the way. And so one of the things he does is he says, I want you to be bold. Now, to be bold for God, you have to be willing to be misunderstood to follow him. I want you to note the word father in verse 25. It's not just do this with your own stuff. Take your father's stuff to do it. To be bold for God, you're going to have to be willing to create new patterns in your life to follow him. In verses 26 and 27, there are new patterns. What are they? Build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this stronghold in an orderly manner and take a second bull, bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah which you have cut down. I want you to take their gods, chop them up, burn them, and put the bull on top. Okay, so now you're taking Papa's bull, you're taking Papa's um, totem pole, and you're <laughs> you're literally cutting the thing down, cutting it up, turning it into firewood, killing his bull. What do you think your dad would say? I know what my dad would have said. And, and then verse 27, Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had spoken to him. And because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city to do it by day, he did it by night. Remember mighty man of valor who was hiding in a hole? All right, I'm going to boldly and courageously do what God said at night, <laughs> just in case. And then I'm going to go, I don't know. <laughs> well, how did that happen? Um, 28 and 29, to be bold for God, you have to be willing to walk a dangerous line to follow him. Note that God did not promise any protection to him. It says verse 29, 28, when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was torn down and the Asherah, which was beside it, was cut down and the second bull was offered on the altar, which had been built. They said to one another, who did this thing? And when they searched about and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, did this thing. Now, it's pretty bold of them, of him to step out and do this, but God has called him to do it. So all God has also not told him that he's not going to die that day. He has said earlier, you're going to be the one I chose to go out and beat the Amalekites and Midianites. So hanging on the earlier promise of God, he steps out and he does what he's told to do. But for a while, can I suggest to you, things had to look bad before they were going to look good. So now the crowd with the pitchforks is gathering outside the palace with Frankenstein hiding inside. You, you, know, you get the idea. It's like a bunch of, oh, let's go get him. And verse 30, then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, for he has torn down the altar of Baal, and indeed he has cut down the Asherah, which was beside it. 
When you're bold for God, you're going to be amazed at the victory that God provides as you build a reputation as one who walks by faith. And, and look what happens to him. Joash said to all that stood against him, will you contend for Baal? Will you deliver him? Whoever will plead for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a God, let him contend for himself because someone has torn down his altar. Look, are you, are you telling me that your God is so strong that you have to come out here and kill my son, but he couldn't even fix his own altar? Uh, if he's a God, couldn't he have stopped my son from doing this? Seriously, I know my son, he's not that strong, okay? And, and, and he offers this kind of thing, and you see emerging out of the story that God is really honoring the obedience of Gideon, Gideon going against the flow. I think it's interesting because... People know your character by your actions, not by your private commitments. And I want you to remember that when he came out and he did something, that's how he became known. I, um, I don't know why. I don't know if it has to do with social media. I don't know what it is. But I seem to be living in a day when people think that planning to do something is the same as doing it. Do you, do you have people like this in your life? They talk about when, someday when I get a job. But they don't go get one. They, they, they talk about things incessantly, but they don't actually do them. Well, the interesting thing is people are changed not by what you think you're someday going to do, but by what you do. Okay? So there's some action required here. Look at verse 30. Opposition to your faith is going to come when you have a clear stand. But in verses 31 and 32, God's victory through you will become your testimony. So in essence, there has to be uh, a time when God calls you forward and you step out and then you're going to take on some opposition. But the only way God is going to show you his strength is by walking through the opposition. And in essence, when you get down to verse 31, Joash stands up for his son. Now, verse 32 says, therefore, on that day, he named him Jerobaal or Yerobaal. That is, let Baal contend against him because he had torn down his altar. Verse 32 is a reputation. You do, you step out and do what God told you to do. Why did God tell him to tear it down? Not only because it was a, a, a place of an idol. Why else? According to verse 32, give me a theory on why you think God told him to do it. He wasn't well known, but he was after that. In other words, God asked him to do something in order to gain a reputation because God is going to use the reputation later. Sometimes God is going to ask you to do some things that are going to require of you a great deal, and you're not necessarily going to know why. Let me suggest to you that sticking by something and getting it done will acquire you a reputation that will allow other people to follow you safely. And, and, and here in this spot, the difference between experiencing the mediocre and the extraordinary is the amount of risk you're willing to take. Anybody who's unwilling to risk in leadership will do very little. You've got to, it's a crazy feature of leadership, but in order to lead, you've got to be willing to risk what you lead. And, and the truth is that there is um, a victory that comes out of this, and the victory is his testimony. That's the whole ballgame. Now, sure, you could go, well, there's one less cultic place, but I'm not sure that would matter in a country full of cultic places. I think the real issue is he comes out with a reputation. All right, so if the first test was picking out God's voice from a noisy generation. And the second test is learning to put God's direction first, even when it costs you, even when it's going to be hard to do in front of your own family. The third test is in 33 to 40, and that's learning to take God at his word. How do you learn to take God at face value with what he says? Because the victorious believer is going to be the one who takes God's promises seriously simply because God made them. That's got to be enough. Verse 33 offers this truth. No matter what the size of the problem, the prescription is to follow the revealed will of God. No matter what the size of the problem, the prescription is always follow the revealed will of God. So in verse 33, all the Midianites and all the Amalekites and the sons of the east assembled themselves and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Now, what did we already know about them? According to uh, what has been said before. How many of them are there? They have camels that are innumerable and they are like locusts on the land. So when they all come together to encamp, it means there's a huge 
camp. The size of the siege was going to have to be huge. And God revealed the outcome. What was the outcome already revealed? It was revealed back in 614. I am going to use you. He says, I have called you to deliver them into your hand. So I want you to see what's happening. God says, I called you, Gideon. Gideon, all right. All right, I want you to go knock down that pole. All right, I did it. I did it at night, but I did do it. And when it came up, I did admit it. Or at least my dad admitted it on my behalf. <laughs> All right, Gid, look at this huge army that's assembling in the Jezreel Valley. I have called you to be the one that defeats it. And here's the thing. Now that he has that, verse 34 says, that so the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and the Abizarites were called together to follow him. <coughs> Victory comes when you act on God's word. Not just when you know it, when you act on God's word. By gathering the resources that are necessary to complete the task. We act as though everything depends on our work, but we know everything depends on God. I want you to go out there and I want you to do ministry like it all depends on you and know that it doesn't depend on you. It depends on him. I see that the Spirit clothed Gideon. I see that Gideon alerted the people. And here's what I see. In chapter 7, verse 3, I find out that 32,000 people followed Gideon. And, and I think what's interesting is he sent messengers through Manasseh, sent them to, to Asher, to Zebulun, to Naphtali. This is all over the Galilee. They came to meet him. Then Gideon said to God, if you will deliver Israel through me, as you have spoken, notice as you have spoken, underline that. In verse 36, Gideon knows he's following the revealed word of God. That's the heart of this passage. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. Now here's the problem. The problem is... Sometimes, even for the believer, God's stated will isn't enough. Some of you know people like this, and some of you have been people like this. God's word isn't enough. Now you need some other sign, something else for him to do. So he says, okay, now I think that this is what you said in verse 36. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm put, put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. And if there's dew on the fleece only, but it's dry on the ground, I'll know you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken. So he puts the fleece out there and he says, now if I wake up in the morning and the fleece is wet, but the ground is dry, I will know that you are right. I, I believe that you told me back in 614 that that's what I'm going to do. I believe that I was already convicted of it by then and you had told me even before that. I believe I've known this for a long time, but I'm just not sure if I don't get a wet fleece. I can't quite know for sure. So then he does it and it says it was so. When he rose early in the next morning, verse 36, and squeezed the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. But see, then he starts thinking, hmm, maybe a, a bear came out here and piddled on my fleece. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, how do I know this is really dew? I, maybe some goats came along and they liked the feel of the fleece, so they just used it as a goat box. I don't know. Maybe local cats. I escaped from Egypt and came up here and piddled on my fleece. So here's the problem with counting on signs. You're never quite sure what they said. See, the problem is when, when believers put their, their trust in healing and miracles and signs, they're never quite sure what it said. When people come to me and go, can God speak through dreams? Yes, he can. Here's the problem with dreams. I don't know if you'll know what he said. The problem is, in very few cases, have I ever really known what it was my dream was about. I have the weirdest dreams. I, I don't remember most of my wife's dreams. Don't even get me started. You know, how many ways have I died in her dreams? A, a thousand different ways. So, so every time we're going to go anywhere, should I like, oh my goodness, you know, the, I'll go on the cruise and it'll sink. <laughs> you know, I'll fly away and I'll die, you know. I don't know what those mean. So my point is that when you don't trust the word of God more than you trust some sign, you're left with a continual uncertainty. So he comes down to verse 39. And Gideon says, now God, don't, don't let your anger burn against me that I may speak once more. Please uh, let me take a test once more with the fleece. This time, 
Now, let the fleece be dry only and let there be dew all over the ground because I figure there can only be so many goats piddling so many places, right? So I want, I, want to, I want to walk through a wet landscape, but I want a dry fleece. God did so that night, for it was dry only on the fleece and the dew was all on the ground. Now, here's the problem. The longer you test, the less you believe the way God told you to believe. The longer you keep saying, God, I need something more than the scripture, the less you're really believing the scripture. So I got to tell you something. You're not going to like it very much. But in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, the fourth test is not Gideon testing God. It's God testing back. There's an old saying, turnabout is fair play. In other words, you don't take me at my word seriously? Well, let me show you what that feels like. And so in chapter 7, God plays a test on Gideon because Gideon has been testing God. Let me suggest to you that if you won't take God's word seriously, you will find yourself being tested in that word. And in uh, chapter 7, verses 1 to 8, this is test number 4. And this is God, God tests back. Here's the four words that are the question. Do you trust me? Question mark. God says, do you trust me? Now, here's what he does. First of all, you have to have the geography setting. Verse 1. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harod um, on the north side uh, of them by the hill of Moreh uh, in the valley. Uh, um, the camp, I'm sorry, the camp of Midian was on the north side by the hill of Moreh in the valley. Here's what I want you to see. In the Jezreel Valley, it's a relatively flat valley. Sticking up in the middle of it is the hill of Moreh. It's not a very high mountain. Then south of it is the, um, is the, valley, uh, the valley that's created by the Harod Spring that comes off of the Mount Gilboa. It, it, the, the problem is the hill of Moreh is higher. The slope comes down to... Um, the, the place where Gideon is. Too many words. The Midianites have the high ground. Gideon has the low ground. Not a good situation for a battle. Gideon gets 32,000 people called together. And I know that because look at verse 3. It says, uh, uh, verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hand, for Israel would become boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. Now therefore come, proclaim in the hearing of the people, and say, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. That means 32,000 showed up. So here's what he says, Gid, You've been testing me, so I'm going to put you in a position now. You got 32,000 people that came, and they looked out there and saw this innumerable number of 100,000 against them, or something. I made up the number, you know, huge number of people against them. Stand up and make the following announcement. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, anybody who's afraid can go home. And two thirds left. Now, if you're Gideon, how are you feeling? You thought, okay, 32,000, all right, we, we can work with this. Now you've got 10,000. Now 10,000 isn't nothing, but it's not 32,000. And what it does tell you is that two-thirds of the people that came out didn't actually believe you could beat them. So now what you have is 10,000 left. And then the Lord says to him, now Gideon, the people that are with you are still too many. Bring them down into the water that I may test them there. And I, that I will test them for you there. Therefore it shall be that he of whom I shall say to you, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But every one of whom I shall say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. I'm about to cut your team. I'm going to get a roster and I'm going to cut everybody off the roster I don't want to go. And he says, um, verse 5, so he brought the people down to the water and... The Lord said to Gideon, you will separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now they're at a stream. And if you read the next verse, verse six says, now the number who lapped by putting their hand to their mouth. So when it says laps as a dog laps, he doesn't mean, okay. He means this, like a dog cups the water in his tongue. They, they go down like this and they get the water and they bring it up to their mouth. But the other people put their face in the water. 
okay? So you got a group of people that come out, and he says, all right, everybody, get a drink of water. And some guys stop, and they go like this. The other guys crawl up to it, put their face down in it. Now, there's a lot of ways to understand the passage, and I'm not sure I'm going to get it right. But let me just say to you, the Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who picked up the water and put it in their mouth and the cup in their hand. I will deliver, I will give the Midianites into your hands and let the other people leave. Now, I have only uh, been twice in war zones, but both times I learned something. Never, never stick up in a war zone. When you're in a war zone, they'll shoot you dead if you're sticking up. So what you do is you get down on the ground. And when you have to go out to where the water is, which is exposed at the bottom of the valley, you don't walk up to it and go like this. How do you do it? You get down and you crawl your way up to it and you drink. Why? Because you're an idiot if you're sticking up on a battlefield. I think that God cut all the smart people and left them with 300 idiots. That's exactly what I think happened. And I'll tell you what, I think that the whole point was, if you're not going to listen to me, then I'm going to show you what testing is all about. I can deliver you. I never asked Israel to deliver itself. I'm going to deliver Israel. And what I think is funny is, it's not what you can accomplish for God that will matter in eternity. It's what he accomplishes through you that will matter in eternity. I, now, I, I love this because... God wants to do it, but not in our strength. The collective ability of this team, I have been in ministry long enough to know that you put two pastors together and they can foul up a two-car a two parade. There is just, we cannot lead that well. What we're asked to do is not be smart. What we're asked to do is take the people of God and equip them and allow God to do his work. It's not about what you think you can accomplish. So I, I say all that to say, well, by the time you get down to verses 9 to 22, now you're at the fifth test. And this is learning again. It's about listening to God. But this is a very interesting thing. Every now and then, when you are, you really want to follow God. You really do. But you're just not quite sure you can. God may give you what I call a sneak a peek test. God may give you a glimpse of a victory before a victory comes. Every now and then, when you get, by the way, when you get to the end of your rope and you cry out to God, he'll give you another foot, not another mile, just another foot, just enough to hang on. And so something really happens. You know, faith is not demonstrated by believing that God's able to do something. That's, that's not faith. Faith is demonstrated by believing that God is going to act on your behalf, that he's going to do something. So you get down to verse 9, and first I want you to see God's assurance in verse 9. God gives a believer direction and requires obedience. And you see in verse 9, Now the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hands. Look at what he says. God said, I am going to give it to you. Is there anything in 9 that makes you doubt that they're going to win? Like, would you have come away from that going, gee, I'm not really sure if God's going to give it to us. Or is he clear? He, he seems clear to me. Now, verses 10 to 14, look at Gideon's reassurance. God understands our hesitation. He gets why we're afraid. And very often he finds ways to strengthen us. So look in verse 10. But if you are afraid to go down, go with Pura, your servant, down to the camp. Now, okay, this sounds like he's double talking. Now, if you're afraid to go down, go down. But that's not what he says. If you're afraid to attack, don't attack. Just take your servant. And, and you will hear what they say. And afterwards, your hands will be strengthened that you may go down against the camp. So he went with Porah, his servant, down to the outpost of the army that was in the camp. Now the Midianites and Amalekites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts and their camels were without number as numerous as the sands on the seashore. When Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to a friend. And he, and he said, behold, I had a dream. Now, here's what I want you to see. Gideon and his servant dress up like Midianites. And they go walking into the Midianite camp. And there's a bunch of guys sitting around at different campfires all over, and they're all over the place. Now, why do they not think that Gideon might not be a Midianite? 
Because an idiot would walk in the middle of a camp with 100,000 enemy soldiers and think he's going to get out alive. So nobody's thinking that, you know, even in the war between the states, a guy from the north could put on a southern uniform and walk into Confederate lines. Nobody would actually think he was from the south. And by the way, there was enough, when you have 10,000 people, you don't know everybody else. So maybe he's a guy you didn't know. Now, now here's the thing. He's walking along, and I want you to see, God has spoken to this man, right? You are going to win. Now, here's what I love. Look at what tilts the balance in his mind that it's really going to happen. It is the record of a person's dream, and it's the dumbest dream you've ever heard in your life. Here's what it is. Behold, I had a dream. Oh, really? Well, tell me, Ed, what was your dream? Well, I, uh, there was this uh, barley loaf, this big loaf of barley bread, and it tumbled into the camp of Midian, and it came to the tent and struck it, and it fell, and it turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. Now, out of that, his friend replied, this is nothing less than we're dead. Gideon's got us. How did you get that out of a barley cake? And see, the whole thing is, if we're stuck on God showing us truth through some specific sign, he'll do it, but it's really dumb compared to his word. The God of heaven said you're going to win, but I can't really believe that, but I really believe the guy who had the barley cake dream and the other guy who interpreted the barley cake dream, he must be telling the truth. You see how dumb this is? So here's the thing. When we're met with the truth, our response has to be telling God he's worth loving and worth serving. That's the only appropriate thing we can do. Look at verse 15. When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. Why? He hadn't won yet. He didn't need to. The victory of Gideon was in verse 15, not after that. The victory against the enemy was first in his heart. For the first time, he truly got it. God, you're really going to do this. President Clinton, after he became president, said that uh, he had gone through all the inauguration balls on the first day of, you know, when they first swear you in. And they had done, I think, nine inauguration balls and had to go through uh, four different gown changes for Mrs. Clinton. I mean, they were just, they had like, you're there 30 minutes, then they sweep you across the city and you're in another big ballroom and moving from place to place. And he said, it, what, that night they picked up in, in Marine One, which is the helicopter, they picked him up and they took him across Washington. And as they went around, they circled the Washington Monument and then they came back in a line and went into the landing spot on the front lawn of the uh, of the White House. And he said, you know, I'd been sworn in. I'd seen the crowds. I'd gone to the balls. The first time I realized I was president was when I was in Marine One and I was landing on the White House lawn. He said, it, it suddenly hit me. Wow, I'm the president. And he said, you know, you, you spend a year running for this thing and asking your friends shamelessly for money and you do all this stuff. And finally, you're there, and now you're supposed to be running a government. And, he's, and he said, up till now, it's been like a circus. I first recognized it. Verse 15 was where he first realized that what God said about his life was going to actually be true. And so he fell down before God. So he returned to the camp of Israel, and he said, get up. The Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. It's interesting, because he did not say he's given it into my hands. Gideon got it. God is going to do this. You are not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. God is going to do this. And he's going to do it not for me, but for you. And verse 16, he divided the 300 men into three <laughs> companies. Now, in my telling of the story, I think he gets the 300 idiots. We're going, oh, what are we supposed to do now, boss? Just shut up and stand there. Stand there, white. Just shut up and stand there, will you? And he put the trumpets and the empty pitchers into the hands of them with torches inside the pitchers. And they're all going, oh, this is fun. Yeah, this is really fun. And it says, um, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do exactly what I do. When I and all who are with me blow the trumpet, then you shall blow the trumpets all around the camp and say, for the Lord and for Gideon. You know why he doesn't say just for the Lord? 
Because the Midianites won't know who's attacking them. They got to make clear that they're with Gideon. Because that's, you know, after all that barley cake thing only works if you actually say it's Gideon. Surprise, it's Gideon. And then it says, so Gideon and the hundred men, uh, uh, Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And when they had just posted the watch, they blew the, blew the trumpets and smashed the pitchers that were in their hands. And when the three companies blew the trumpets and broke their pitchers, they held their torches in their left hands and their trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And, set and cried, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Now here's the play on the words. They got a torch in the left hand. They have a trumpet in the right hand. And the only sword they have is the one they're yelling about. They don't actually have one. Okay? So you got to wonder. By the way, I think that's one of the reasons that God sent the idiots. The smart people wouldn't do this. They go, no, I'm taking a sword. What are you telling? I'm not walking out there with a trumpet. That guy's got a sword. I have a trumpet. How am I going to win? So here's what you end up with. It's a, a, and they come out. They each stood in his place around the camp. And all the army ran, crying out as they fled. Ah! Now, I want you to picture this. You got a bunch of guys breaking pots, holding up torches, blowing trumpets, and going, we have swords! And they're all going, ah! And they all have swords, but they run, okay? And that's exactly the way the story is told. Now, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> this is a great story. Somebody should do a cartoon with this. I cannot understand why VeggieTales didn't do this first. Tell me this is not a great VeggieTales tale waiting to be told right here. I'd pay to go see this. Cucumbers, <laughs> tomatoes, just going wild, making salsa. <laughs> Uh, when they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set, set the sword of one against another, even throughout the whole army. And the army fled as far as the edge of Abel Meholah, which is all the way up near Lebanon. So this is a long, long scattering, okay, uh, by Tabat. The men of Israel were su summoned from Naphtali, Naphtali and Asher and all Manasseh, and they pursued Midian. I think this is, a, this is a phenomenal story. The phenomenal part about this story is they all end up like killing each other. The, the, the Israelites don't have swords. They have trumpets. People are hacking away at each other. They're all on the same side. I mean, they can't see. They got bright lights in their face and they just start swinging swords and killing everybody around them. Then there, the other guys are running, trying to get over him. Then this guy's killing his old roommate and all kinds of, you know, dorm not violence going on here. Everything is crazy here. Now, the important thing is this. When you come away from 9 to 22, you should come away with an understanding that God can make a victory that barely <coughs> requires our attendance. <coughs> you know what? The, the biggest part of your life will be showing up when God works. <laughs> Seriously. You're going to get credit in ministry for a thousand things you don't even do. You just have to show up and let God be God. In essence, the biggest thing you can do for your ministry is stay out of God's way. Don't let your sin hinder God from what he wants to do, okay? Because if you'll just show up and let him do it, he's got cool stuff he wants to do. I just want to remind you that Jesus never once rebuked his disciples for not having their sandals clean or their togas pressed, but he did constantly rebuke them for a lack of faith. What is faith? Seeing the world as God says it is, not as my eye sees it without him. Faith is like God glasses. Seeing the world through what God says is true is true. Jesus constantly said to his disciples, how is it that you have no faith? Does everybody think we could say that to the modern church? How is it that you can't see the world through what I said? Because I see that as the major problem in the church today. We're also busy trying to make sure that people feel that we've been fair, that we're not worried about whether God feels we've been fair with what he told us. If it's God's church, let him tell you how it's supposed to be. It's his and I guess in the end, without faith, we can't act decisively and we can't act with power to please God. And we don't often really believe him. I think that you've gotten into five tests in Gideon's life. And the whole purpose of these tests were to lay out for you the idea of how God helps you to face an insurmountable <coughs> problem. I think it's interesting because um, we can live by faith. God can heal disease by faith. 
God justifies by faith. He saved us through faith. We can walk in faith. We can draw God in faith. Uh, but here's the bottom line. If we're not going to believe what God said is true, is true, and we're going to chase after a bunch of signs, all we're doing is testing God, and we're never going to quite be sure that his word is enough. Let me finish this segment by saying, would you please let God's word be enough? Because if his word is not enough, you are going to find yourself constantly chasing the next thing. Um, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back, and we are going to take a look next at the son of Gideon, because I, I want to see if you can see a little bit more about how the story plays out. Gideon actually goes on. He lives all the way through chapter 8, and uh, he actually becomes quite important. But if you go to 828, it says, So Midian was subdued before the sons of Israel. They did not lift their heads anymore, and the land was undisturbed for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Now Gideon had 70 sons. Because Jeroboam is, a, you know, also probably some foreign word for rabbit. I don't know. Anyway, he has <laughs> lots, of, lots of kids. And they were his direct descendants, for he had many wives. Okay? Uh, his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son. And he named him Abimelech. Av, his father. E, my father, Avi. Melech, king. My God is king. Or my father is king. Um... Is his father king? Abimelech means prince. That's what it means. My father is king means you're the prince. So he called him prince. Why? Because Gideon seemed like he was. For 40 years, he had taken the pressure off of them. And everybody's like, when they think of Gideon, yeah, he's the man, you know. The funny part was it was God who did it because Gideon walked out with 300 idiots with pots. But here's what it says. Gideon, the son of Joash, died at the ripe old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash at Ophrah with the Abizarites. Then it came about, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the sons of Israel again played harlot with the Baals. Okay, here we go. Now we're going back into our sin cycle, and this is the beginning of sin cycle five. And made Baal Barit. The Barit is the word for covenant. God of, that is the Baal of the covenant, their God. Thus the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the household of Jeroboam, Baal, that is Gideon, in accord with all the good that he had done to Israel. So not only did people forget the goodness of God, they also forgot the goodness of God through Gideon and they did not exalt his household. They simply set them aside. Because what happens is when people downgrade God in society, they downgrade believers in society. 